So I recently got through the book on ancient Egypt, and I just got through a book on ancient Mesopotamia, and I thought it was really interesting, and I wanted to kind of share what I thought was the most fascinating aspect of them, which is how civilization first developed. Because I hadn't known a lot of this stuff, and it's just very interesting. I think probably the most interesting thing I found was that bread predates agriculture by thousands of years. And people are probably going, but Arjun, like, how did they have bread without without cultivating it? Now, the thing is, I think we forget is that all grains are grasses. Um, they're, they're, the grass you have on your lawn is, is just a different species. If you look at wheat it, and you think about it, it does look like a grass. The, um, the seeds on it look very similar to the seeds on the grass that grows in your backyard, etc., so if, if it's under cultivation now, that means it, 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 it's a plant and that means it must have been in the wild and weed, at least some species of it, are native to the Nile and Mesopotamia. So just it's, it's difficult, like I said, for us to imagine, but imagine there's these huge fields of wheat just everywhere. Uh, or not everywhere, but, but you'll, you're in a primeval man, you're walking around, there's just these huge fields of wheat. And you eventually kind of figure out that you can eat it. I think you can just eat grain off of the um, the plant. I don't think it's particularly pleasant. But if you look at like barley or rice or any of the kind of other grains, you can just eat them whole. Uh, I think you have to shuck them or whatever. But you can just eat corn off of the cob. So you can definitely eat grains without any kind of processing. So... People, so early man was like, well, uh, we have this grain that just grows all over the place. Why don't we start eating it? So people would, uh, the, the sickle was invented thousands of years before farming was. People invented sickles. I think the first ones were just kind of sharp stones attached to a stick or something in the, the crescent formation. But people would go and harvest these fields of wheat. They developed millstones pretty easily on. They grind it together. And they'd make bread out of it. They'd mix it with water. So once again, I, I, I know I keep repeating myself, but it's, it's fascinating. Because um, once again, it's a bit like horses. Horses used to be wild animals, but they aren't anymore. Cows used to be wild animals, but I don't know even know if there's wild cows anymore. I mean, there's there's wild animals like cows, but like ox, like um, buffalo and, and that kind of thing, like Cape buffalo. But I don't know if there's really wild, like, Jersey cows or, or any kind of the species we bred. However, there used to be wild wheat. And the book on Egypt suggests that people would actually start tending the wheat before they formally figured out how to farm. So I guess they'd pull out weeds and maybe they'd clear more land for the wheat to expand itself naturally rather than directly farm it. And it's just kind of such an unusual thing. Another kind of interesting thing is people would often have their, their teeth ground down because early bread was obviously a lot coarser because they didn't really process it. They just kind of ground it up, mixed it with water and, and ate it. But also because you're grinding it through stones, parts of the stones would come off as like grit or sand and it'd get mixed into the bread and that would uh, wear your teeth down. The, the good thing, though, is cavities were extremely rare. And, and tooth decay in general because you have all this grit like abrasive stuff against your teeth plus there wasn't sugar so like you always wonder how come how did people in the ancient world deal with it because it seems like everybody needs orthodontics or everybody needs fillings people just didn't really need that prior to the modern era because a there was no pure sugar uh and b everybody ate really coarse stuff once again by the time you got old your teeth would be ground down but that's probably better than getting like an infection i mean eventually people would start to get those but it's not like it was completely unheard of the other thing with orthodontics is a big issue is just the food we eat now is a lot softer than previous generations so that's part of the reason our, our jaws don't grow exactly right so, so yeah like i said people started harvesting wheat um, also, they were hunter-gatherers. And once again, you have to wonder, how did they have enough food? Keep in mind, these are very small populations. And without large amounts of territory cleared out to farm and to build cities, there was just a lot of animals everywhere. 
I think also animals weren't necessarily as afraid of humans back then. But yeah, there, there was generally enough meat. There was berries. There was fruit, I guess, like dates and stuff and olives. I Actually, I'm not sure if olives are where they're native to. I think they're native to the Mesopotamia. Don't quote me on that. But something the book said that, that was interesting is hunter-gatherer societies ha are much better fed and have a much, they're taller, they're healthier, and they're, um, they, there's a lot more free time than farming societies have. And this is kind of always a thing when you hear about uh, herdsmen versus farmers and like uh, in Sudan or whatever, you hear about like the Janjawi nomads versus the sedentary farmers. And, and there's often kind of a picture in your mind that, oh, the, the primitive horsemen are uh, attacking the farmers because they're jealous of them. But then you start thinking about it and the farmers are scratching a bare subsistence living on unproductive dry land. Whereas think about it, a head of cow is like a thousand bucks. And these people have herds of like thousands of cows. Uh, the, these things are a lot more expensive. So they're a lot wealthier. And meat is a much denser, denser energy source than, than wheat is. So I think it's, I forget it's who it was in Africa, but there's some hunter-gatherer people, and they only work like 18 hours a week gathering food. Because if you can kill a buffalo or something, that can feed you guys for weeks. That's a huge amount of meat. And this is back when they ate the whole animal, including the fat and stuff. If you're eating like the marrow and the fat and stuff, that's an extremely energy-dense food. And the wheat and the other stuff grows itself, so they had a lot more free time to just kind of enjoy life. Which, once again, is, is interesting because people view them as being kind of primitive. So they were actually a lot taller during this era than they would be once farming became widespread. Because probably, the aside from just genetics, the single largest determinant of height is protein levels. So part of the reason that the, the Greeks and the Italians were not as tall as the Germans was well italians are naturally shorter in a lot of cases the greeks are actually a very tall people but because they're more hunter gatherer but i digress is just because germans had a much more protein rich diet they ate a lot more meat cheese milk that kind of thing and that allows you to grow taller if you look at uh, asian countries the, the current generation is much taller than the previous generation because they're wealthier and they can afford a lot more protein um, I, I knew someone from South Korea and he said they basically force feed the kids even though they're lactose intolerant milk because it's made them grow a lot bigger and, and healthier. And in Greece, the average height has shot up as the country's developed and people can start eating more food because modern Greek cooking has tons of protein in it. Uh, tzatziki, lots of meat, uh, fish has protein in it. And generally speaking, the wealthier society is, the larger meat uh, proportion meat becomes in it. And there's all this like meme that meat's bad for you, etc. And I guess too much of it's bad for you. But particularly when you're growing, you need as much protein as possible so you can grow big and strong. So once they once these first civilizations emerged and they started farming, people dropped, I think it was like six to eight inches. It's some huge amount that they, they shrunk because they started eating mainly carbs instead of protein and fat. So what, what started to happen is because there was so much food, the population gradually increased. Interestingly, once again, villages formed long before farming because they'd form near a river because most civilizations form near rivers before you get into like aqueducts and, and that kind of thing because it's just, it's so convenient. So you just walk over, get water, drink the water. It's, it's, it's just really important. Um, you, you need water for everything, for cooking, for drinking, for making bread, all, all kinds of stuff. So also plants tend to grow near water. Even if you're not irrigating or, or you're farming, uh, if you, there's just more plants. There's more trees, there's more grass, that kind of things. So villages started to form and the, the smaller villages could very easily support a, a sizable population. However, once again, the population started expanding and expanding. And soon they just couldn't get enough from the local area to feed the population. And, and that's kind of what farming developed in response to was hunter gathering for an expanding population just couldn't provide enough resources for it to go around. So they started farming, 
And farming, even if people were shorter, it allowed a reliable food supply. So populations continued to grow. And as they grew, th there was an immediate need for more kind of social organization. And this is kind of one of the issues I have with, and I don't want to turn this into kind of a separate political diet diatribe, with kind of, uh, I guess, kind of anarcho-capitalists, anarcho etc., cetera, is civilization spontaneously develops government because it's necessary to organize large groups of people. What else I think is interesting is religion emerges very quickly in, in primitive societies or in early civilization. Almost immediately, people started to develop gods. They started believing that gods controlled things. And you see a priestly caste almost immediately emerge. And it, it's um, like part of this is just, once again, when there's an excessive amount of food, which is provided by farming, you can start to have people specialize. You can have someone who just weaves, who just makes uh, shoes, who just makes bread, and the person can get specialized tools. Almost with anything in life, the more you work at it, the better you get. So the more you weave, the better the cloth, the faster you can do it. So it allowed the de development of specialists. And the, priest, the, the priestly caste emerged, and very early on they started to develop writing. Now, interestingly, the oldest kind of formal government in human history is theocracy. Very early on, the priests became rulers of their own uh, villages and eventually their own cities, etc. And they started to develop writing. Now, very early writing was, was not really used in the way we would use it today for uh, literature or philosophy or, or that kind of thing. It, it's a very practical development because being able to record accounts and do basic, basic math is extremely useful. So you can go, okay, we're growing enough wheat to feed a thousand people. Uh, he, each person gets, I don't know, X number of bushels of wheat a week. Um, we can mark it off when people pick the wheat up. Oh, this person hasn't picked up the wheat. Oh, we don't, we, we only raised, I don't know, 800 bushels of wheat this year, et cetera. And it was just immensely useful um, to, to be able to develop this writing. And all the various languages in the region would adopt cuneiform. So even if the language was different, at least the writing system was the same, which made translation a lot easier. But yeah, very early on, they developed these uh, writing systems. They developed a, a priestly caste that kind of ruled society. And the, the it's, it's kind of hard because we don't have a lot of written records. We have like administrative records, like X person is paying X thing. And you kind of have the beginnings of taxes where priests, because they they don't work the fields necessarily, they they are given um, donations from the public, which is kind of like the beginnings of a tax system. And what kind of started to happen is as they got bigger, the priests would start to elect kings. Now, there's some speculation that initially kings were just a a um, appointed office that would only last for a certain period of time, but eventually they became hereditary. And so it depended on the society, but some societies like Assyria, the king was also the high priest. So the king of Assyria was also the high priest of the god Ashur, um, whereas in other societies, there's kind of more of a, a separation between the two. But like I said, very early on, uh, religion developed. Cities, once they started to emerge, each city had its own god. Uh, each city would, would develop its own king. And these things kind of spontaneously developed within um, independently of another. I guess there was some kind of trade between them. Trade did kind of start to develop very early on because things like some things only grew in certain parts of the world or were only found in certain parts of the world. Like Mesopotamia, I don't think, has metal. So they would have to import copper and tin from the Arab Arabian Peninsula and they trade uh, fabric with them. Um, Egypt obviously had grain and gold, so they would trade for wood or lapis lazuli and, and kind of other things. So trade developed very early. What's kind of interesting is merchants were allowed to have two wives, one at the place they traded with and one in their home area. So that was something that, that very early earlier on emerged and kind of the development of money was kind of a response to the emergence of trade because money is just very convenient because initially things were just 
in kind. So you'd say, uh, I'll trade this bushel of wheat for that ox or something. But what people found is, okay, we'll have silver, we'll have a rough weight of silver and I'll trade you silver for this. Now the silver was probably in the form of ingots or um, ingots or jewelry or something, but there is a rough idea that this amount of silver buys this, etc. And it was just such a useful measurement of exchange. Interestingly, coinage and that kind of thing developed once bureaucracy and, and formal militaries developed because governments had to have a standardized way of paying civil service employees. So that's kind of where coinage comes from. But the idea of trading X amount of precious metals or shells or, or some other or beads or some other standard measurement is very old. However, kind of one of the issues, and if you ever read something from early empires, you'll hear them say they, they, they standardize weights, measurements, etc. And you're like, what does that mean? Because every city used to have its own measurement system. They might be similar, but they'd be a little different. The weights would be a little different. So that's kind of one of the first things empires tended to do was everybody's going to use the same weight system. Everybody knows what like a cubit is. Everyone knows what a shekel is. It's X weight over and done with uh, that kind of thing. So, so we have these city states emerging with kind of these king priests, etc., and eventually, as, as society, cities began to build, they started to go to war with one another and try to conquer. So uh, there's always just if you can conquer another city, then you get more power, you get more wealth, etc. There's also an as a religious aspect to it, because I, I think it's what it's most similar to in. Um, a Song of Ice and Fire, you have the Dothraki who believe other gods exist, but they believe the great stallion is the strongest god. So when they invade other societies, they'll, they'll destroy them, take statues of their god and put it in Vel Dothrak to show that they're superior. And that's something that they would often do during the uh, this era, is every city would have its god, but if you could destroy another city and bring its god back, then you showed your god was superior and you took their gods as your own. Because the ancient Mesopotamians believed that statues were actually gods. It's kind of interesting. They dwelled in heaven, but the statue was also literally the god. The god could see through the eyes of the statue. So people would feed the statues. They would protect them, etc. There was a, a myth in Babylon that Marduk created humans so that the gods wouldn't have to work. Uh, that humans would just produce all the things required for the gods' sustenance and they could live lives of leisure. So if you went and you captured another city's gods and you brought them back, then they became your gods, which is very interesting. Um, it's also kind of interesting because there is a ceremony to become a king of Babylon where you had to take Marduk's hand, which is a, a long ritual, but it, it literally involves taking Marduk's hand and like shaking hands with the statue and when Marduk was captured and his statue was taken away, they, people couldn't formally become king of Babylon because Marduk is gone. And they couldn't just make another statue because so long as that statue existed, that was Marduk. So it's, it's very, it's kind of fascinating. And people didn't normally see their gods. It's a bit like how ancient Judaism was, where there was the Holy of Holies, where instead of a god god, there's the Ark of the Covenant. Um, within it. So they, they had open theism, but there's also often a belief that their city god was the most powerful and that their city god was uh, to prove their, the strength of their god, they had to conquer others. The gods were kind of blamed and, and praised for everything. If something good happened, it was because of a god. If something poor happened, it wasn't a god. It's, it's interesting just how superstitious they were by modern standards. It's like during the the taking of Marduk's hand, the high priest punched the king in the face. And if the king, tears came to the king's eyes, it meant that Marduk was pleased and that the king would have a successful uh, time in office. However, if the king didn't cry, then that would mean that his reign would be a disaster and Marduk rejected his kingship. It's also kind of interesting during the taking of Marduk's hand because one of the things they do is they bring all the gods from Babylon and they put them in a room together. The idea being that they're kind of having a conference. It's, it's, it's very fascinating kind of the way that these things work. But 
like I said, very early on, bureaucracy develop, taxes develop. Kind of one of the interesting things about taxes is taxes weren't all collected at the same time, uh, particularly within the Assyrian and Akkadian Empire. Different cities and different vassal kings paid taxes at different times of year. So every month someone would pay taxes. The taxes would go to the capital city and that would sustain the mother province for that month. Then they take the taxes from the next place. And there was actually like towns and cities established near the, the, the capital that would just process all this stuff that was flowing in year round. And this makes a lot of sense because... A lot of things go bad. Obviously, wheat doesn't go bad normally, but it's it's good to have this flowing in at all times of, of the year. But there was this very strong belief that the gods were imminently involved with all aspects of life. That and and kings would attribute everything to what the gods would do. Egypt was a bit different because the king was held to be a literal god. He was the incarnation of Horus. But it's a little different in kind of Mesopotamia proper. So you start to have empires emerge. And that kind of became the default for a large period of time is kings would have vassal kings. And this is something that would frequently happen is sometimes if one kingdom conquered another, they often wouldn't put the royal family to sword. They would just become vassal kings and send taxes and tribute to their overlord. And kind of the great powers would trade vassal kings, etc. It's kind of interesting. There was a time period where you had kind of a, you had three great powers. You had Assyria, the Hittite Empire, and Egypt. And they were all roughly equal in strength. And they would kind of maintain peace through royal marriages. But there was always kind of a fear that two of the superpowers would ally against the third superpower. So it's, it's really interesting to see these things start to emerge in an early society and, and, and kind of things that will repeat themselves later on. Some kind of other interesting things about ancient Mesopotamia is they developed a system based on the number 60. So you have, um, so, and that's where we get 60 minutes. That's where we get 60, uh, sorry, 60 minutes an hour, 60 seconds in a minute. And they use that instead of the number 10, which is kind of what developed elsewhere because 60 is a lot easier to use because you can divide 60 into thirds, you can divide it into fifths, you can divide it into sixth. It's it's very it's a very easy number to use as opposed to 10 because they didn't like to have like a third of 10 is kind of complicated, uh, etc. 60 was just a lot easier to use. Kind of another interesting thing is for most of human history, the calendar has been pretty similar. Uh, the Egyptians initially had their, uh, their own calendar. I'm not sure exactly. I think it was a lunar calendar. I don't remember what exactly it was based on, but it wasn't 365 days. So what they noticed very quickly, because the Egyptian New Year whenever was whenever the Nile flooded, but they found that it was different every year. So the Nile, like in some cases, it, it would just it would be a different month every year, and people were like, "Well, this doesn't make any sense. It it it's it." If it's our new year, then the year shouldn't vary in length. It shouldn't be sometimes more than one year. It shouldn't sometimes be like a couple months, etc. So very early on, Egypt and I think uh, Mesopotamian civilizations adopted a 365-day calendar because that was approximately uh, the, like, like I said, a, an accurate measure of time for things like seasons, the flooding of the Nile, etc. It allowed a certain amount of predictability. So once again, it's these people weren't stupid. They they realized these things pretty early on. I mean, to them, it was pretty obvious. Okay, our calendar needs to... If, if days are changing every year, we're going to have to change the calendar. A another kind of interesting thing is years in ancient Mesopotamia were not named... Were not like numbered they were named after specific achievements of the king so like some years like i think the longest one was like in, in hammurabi the great conquered the people of x city x city x city x city he passed x laws he ate x for breakfast like some of the the name the years for the names of the years could be like pages and pages long and eventually what they started to develop in ancient Mesopotamia was king's lists, which I think 
made it like a de facto numbering system because it's just not practical to name every year something different which is kind of an issue rome also had because each year was named after who the two consuls were but they eventually kind of developed a system based on the foundation of rome uh so years since the foundation of rome but once again the the julian calendar was pretty accurate the only issue was it was 365 days without leap years so that that was fixed with the gregorian calendar but eastern european uh, the orthodox still use the julian calendar which is why uh christmas and sorry christmas is at a different time of the year in their calendar because there's been drift over time but anyways that's just kind of some thoughts on the the foundation of civilization some thoughts on ancient mesopotamia and egypt as always i hope you enjoyed the video and i'll talk to you guys again later soon